School is our solution. Um, it's our means of social and personal transformation. It's a tool of social justice, how we can rise up in a meritocratic society um, and ensure that everyone is best prepared to live amongst us. Um, the world over, in international and national documents of all sorts, uh, the answer is school. How come, though, uh, we still have such a long way to go, despite seeing school as the answer for such a long time? I can see you all drawn to these fantastic drawings here. Um, Kieran is thrilled, Kieran Sheehy over there, and they'll be uh, littered throughout the whole of the uh, uh, presentation. Um, I was having, having lunch with, uh, or supper or something with a, with a Norwegian colleague, and I'll mention Norway a few times because um, I, I've done a fair amount of work in there, Arun Haustater. And Arun was talking about the 20% who don't benefit from education system, and he was going back to the, the Warnock report. And he was talking about it being a, a place of storage. Children are just passing through and the school remains beyond them. Um, he, meant, he talks about getting as many possible, passing as much as possible, as quickly as possible, as cheaply as possible. He says that in Norwegian, and so that's his rough translation for me. Um, now, I think given the social inequalities that are evident around us, um, that perhaps 20% is an under, um, underestimation, and I, I'll think about that and why that might be this evening. So, uh, one of the things that, uh, that, that uh, informs the, uh, my thinking around this is a study that I did with Kieran and, and, and some other colleagues uh, looking at uh, special education in 50 different countries, which we did for the National Council for Special Education in Ireland. And we looked across 50, 55 administrations. Uh, and what was clear amongst uh, uh, many findings was that children were marginalised in all settings, in all, in all countries. Uh, who was marginalised and why they, was mar they were marginalised varied from, from system to system, but they were marginalised in every system. And it's not like this is a big surprise. People know about this. So UNESCO, for example, talk about uh, access being dependent, I'm reading now, on powerful influences of circumstances such as wealth, gender, ethnicity and location over which people have little control and so on. Um, but I think you could probably add a um, considerable number of other um, matters to that. You could add um, being summer born. You could add uh, having a parent on military duty. Uh, you could add um, experiencing emotional, physical, intellectual, sensory challenges. You could add um, societal responses to sexuality. Then there's uh, influence of parental involvement. There's uh, family structure, home language. Uh, there's uh, reading, how many books um, uh, are read at home, the national economic policy. All of these things have been demonstrated to have an input on the, on the outcome of, of students. Um, and uh, experiences of difficulty in mental health, which seems to have risen to the fore recently and seems to have having been ignored for ages. I've just seen that my, my show started, my show, my slides started um, uh, out of sync, so I've been going for 33 minutes, so my timings on this are now shot, <laughs> OK? So I now have to write down, that's 33, OK, well, wish me luck. OK, so... Um, of course, marginalisation is frequently a consequence of hidden factors, um, processes which are, are rarely reflected upon. And one of, one of the um, things that we've got to recognise is that there are a wide range of causal factors out there that we have no idea about. One of my favourite um, uh, uh, correlations is that the more uh, baths you have as a child, the earlier you learn to read. Um, now, I have a theory as to why that might be, but um, th there are a, a range of factors that may emerge as being... I don't think baths really probably do. I think it's about the amount of times you read if you are the sort of parent who also give baths, but that's another issue. OK, so an issue that's not mentioned in that list at all is uh, monolingualism. And the fact that uh, so many children are marginalised, so many young people are marginalised in an education system which is fundamentally using one language. And it's one of the reasons that I'm standing up here now. And I worked in Hackney, which was for, for 13 odd years. In the last two or three years, I worked with a bunch of um, refugee children. They were young adults. And they were in the sixth form. And some of them were economic migrants as well. And they were, they were fantastic young women. And they, most of them were doing an ICT uh, entry-level foundation course. And uh, none of them passed. Um, they all failed, even though they were doing work that I couldn't do uh, with, uh, with using technology. But what they would do is they, were, they had a multiple choice English test that they had to do at the end. And so they all failed. They did the year again. Then they failed again. Then they did the year again. I got, after the third year of this one young woman failing, I was so incensed. It was one of the reasons that 
that I left. Um, and that monolingual business is evident across nations. Uh, it's not just Hackney, it's Spain, it's uh, California, it's Ghana, it's um, uh, the Sami in Norway. It, it, it's, it's all around us. And it's very basic presumptions about things like language um, that uh, are embedded into emerging policies, that are embedded into emerging practices and types of schooling that have been established and, and, and that reinforce the inequalities of participation and access that already exist in the wider society. So here's a cracker. Here's a safe play area <laughs> built for a kid in, in Scotland. This was to make it nice and safe for him to play in the, in the playground. Parents raised money for this one to happen. They then had to campaign to get it removed. Now, the problem is, is what went on in someone's head to think that was what was meant by a safe play area? It was a head teacher in a primary school. So this is, this is permanent exclusions uh, per 100,000 pupils in England. Um, as you can see, there's more in secondary than there are in, in primary. Um, on average, there are 35 children being expelled per school day um, in, this, in this country. Um, there's uh, 6,685 children were permanently excluded from all primary, secondary and special schools in 2015 and 16. Robbie, who sat at the back, has just been, my, my son who sat in the middle, has just been um, uh, basically um, suspended and excluded from his school after seven days because they've decided, Plumpton College by the way, it's really um, not my cup of tea at the moment. Um, and they have done nothing that was required in the Equalities Act um, to, to facilitate his, his access. It's another issue. I'm sure they would say something different. Uh, the number of fixed term exclusions in this country is 339,360. That was in 2015, 2016, which is roughly 4.29% of enrolments. Now, you've got to accept that some of those children are, are, and young adults are, are going to have been excluded more than once uh, across that period of time. But the public policy research that looks at it recently will say you add to that, there's another 48,000 children who are being uh, educated outside of the mainstream permanently outside of, of, of secondary schools, of special schools, um, and um, that's roughly one in 200 pupils um, this is happening to. And then you've got to look at a survey that was done of parents of, uh, of, of, of autistic uh, people, and they were saying um, that uh, they, it was only it was 365 people, it's not a huge, or 370 or something, but it's not a huge survey. But still, 22% of them were saying that their children were being illegally excluded at least once a week, and 15% that their children were being excluded once a day, every day, for the whole of their school career. I could go into figures in Scotland and so forth. Here's a good one. I love this one. <coughs> Kieran, you're going to think... A girl can't yeah. eat lunch with her friends at school because of a food allergy. Her mom says the segregation is unfair and hurtful. Nine on your sides, Brianna Harper. Talk to school officials about its reasonings for the policy. A mother is calling for a policy change here at the children's house, a change that will make her daughter and other students feel more welcome and less separated. It's now become routine for Brandy Lynn Grosso to spend her lunch hour with her five-year-old daughter, Mia. She enjoys a packed lunch like most students, but Mia's meal is gluten-free. Going to, uh, of course, the local Kroger and making sure we had the correct bread and the correct um, wheat, you know, non-wheat products. These are just a few of the changes to Mia's diet after she was diagnosed with celiac disease. It's a disorder that makes it difficult to properly ingest gluten, causing intestinal pain. It's also one of many food allergies that the Children's House recognizes. Once you're identified as an, al an allergy, that you are sat at a different table alone. Um, they did make me aware that if there was another child in the class that had an allergy, that it would also sit with Mia. According to a representative from the school, the separate food allergy table is meant to protect students from sharing foods and causing a medical emergency. But Mia's mom says her daughter's condition is different. If she did happen to eat a piece of bread or something like that, it wouldn't cause a traumatic injury. Instead of having Mia sit alone, her mother chooses to pick her up for lunch each day in hopes of eliminating the idea of isolation. I didn't want her to view it in a poor light that 
there was something wrong with her, and, and she was starting to identify with that to where when we'd have family meals, she would eat at the, she wouldn't eat at the island by herself. The school claims the food allergy table is not a targeted attack, and there is a possibility that certain changes could be made in the future. Brianna Harper, 9 on your side. Nine on your side did reach out to one local child psychologist about this situation to learn more about its emotional impact on the kids. And she tells us it's not uncommon for children to feel some isolation due to their food allergy. But she says parents can help by fully explaining the condition to their child so they feel more accepted. Yeah, that, that's really important. You've got to reach out to a psychologist to tell you this about <laughs> that you're going to feel marginalized if you're made to sit at a table on your own. Um, uh, that's not onion news in case you're wondering. Um, so, this doesn't mean that dietary problems aren't an issue. And it doesn't mean that they're not an issue for school. It does mean that we're probably not, this school is probably not responding to it in an appropriate manner. Um, so, um, one of the, the things that I, I do is, I've asked, would say that I'm interested in people thinking about, is the fundamental ways of approaching it. So I'll come back to behaviour um, in a minute. Um, uh, but there are certain things that we do and that we do without, without question that, that are hugely problematic. Um, and one of the key ones, I believe, is relying on the written word um, and our obsession with reading and writing. Um, we seem to have, uh, and, as a, as, and it's, it's because we use it as a main way, I, I don't have a problem with reading and writing, I think reading and writing is cracking, I think a good book's brilliant, don't get me wrong, and, and reading for pleasure, fantastic, it's great. But it's uh, about um, it being the main means to always present, share and evaluate ideas. Um, and we seem to have a belief that uh, reading and writing is fundamental to everything we do as a society and that it is inherently more invaluable to individuals and society than other tools. Now, personally speaking, I think cooking is more important. Um, I, I think probably building a house is more important. Um, and reading and writing have a function to play, but they're not, there are other things, I think, that are more important to us as a society. And one of the great things is, is that we haven't done it for very long. So if you went to a medieval play, the ordinary would be stood behind the actor, whispering the words to the actor, and then the actor would be doing the performance. And they'd jump between actors. And I tell you, I've seen, I've seen Greg doing it, and I promise you, when he's doing it, you don't see the ordinary <laughs> stood behind him. You see him doing the acting. And, and that's so easy for it to take place. And I, how many of you had dictate? I've dictated most of this. I don't write anymore. And it can read it back to me. In fact, I could go home and it could read it to you. <laughs> so reading and writing has not been very important for very long. And it won't be very important in the future either. It's fundamentally important to society. But it's not absolutely everything that we need. Or it's certainly worth... Um, considering the consequences if you do. Now, I'm about to show you something which is um, uh, uh, two problems with it. One is its functional literacy. And, and people don't, uh, they don't necessarily agree with functional literacy as a concept, and they don't agree necessarily about the way that the stats are drawn around it. Um, it's also, uh, I'm not trying to say that there's a, you can, uh, you know, that this is absolutely certain. But it's, it's certainly worth seeing what happens around the world. Functional literacy measures and tests. This one was done in 2012. They'll be doing another one. I think they're doing one at the moment. And they go around all the country and they see uh, uh, what, what, le what, what functional literacy people have. And they reckon that below a level two, you don't have the literacy to take advantage of the marketplace. So that kind of means that you, you're not in a good place with your language to get jobs. And if you look across the world, um, uh, the best country to be in, it's around about 30% of people in Japan are below le are level two or below. So that means that they're not uh, at functional literacy, uh, as deemed by the OECD and, and others, um, uh, is not, is not uh, at that level. In France, they're up at nearly just about 50 odd percent, but most of us are around about 40 to 50% of the population are deemed to not be able to ask, access the working um, uh, workplace because of their, their literacy. Um, so, uh, hang on. Our main means of teaching people is reading and writing. And then when we put them in the workplace, we say they can't do it. And then we say it's something wrong with them or it's something wrong with our teaching system. Actually, I think, how many of you can dance? I can't, my wife can. Caroline's a brilliant dancer, I'm rubbish. So. 
we can't all be great at everything. So why should everybody be great at reading and writing? Uh, some of us patently aren't. What's wrong with that? So maybe there are better ways of doing it. Um, GCSEs kind of fit this. I mean, I know they've gone up and down. So in the 90s, 70s, we were around about 30-odd percent getting five to eight Cs, and then we, we had grade inflation, and now we've tried to push it back down again. Um, but we were around about 60-odd percent, 60 Four percent got five A to Cs, and if you include in, in 2015, uh, and that drops to 53.8 percent got maths and English, and passed maths and English. So, I mean, you're at that 40 odd percent of people who are struggling um, with reading and writing. Now, I can't say it's definitely the reading and writing that's causing the problem, but there does seem to be uh, a, uh, a. It seems to be worth considering. It does seem to mean that our means of delivering and assessing the curriculum might well be dooming people to um, low levels of achievement. Um, which, uh, you know, we can raise this by a small amount over a period of time. We can put a huge amount of effort in and get it down by 10%, and it might take us 20 years, but we've had 20 years of all those percentages of people who've been struggling. There's another one. This is slightly more recent. This, uh, the, this one was last year. Um, this one's in Australia. Um, but what's great is you can see the musical instruments there. So he could just, just almost touch out to do something interesting. Um, and this is a cooling off area. Um, so then, then you think about schools as a, uh, you know, your, your response kind of, you see the problem of that image. And you recognise that uh, schools are a social place, a place where relationships should be taking place. And you see a picture like that and you immediately feel this is awkward, this is wrong. So here's something that a study that was undertaken in Norway. I've looked for a similar study more recently. I haven't been able to find one. And the point of this study is cited all over the place as being evidence that people with special educational needs or special needs, as the study called it, um, are, have less friends in school. That's the point of this study. Um, as it's reported, you can see it's 14.3% uh, with no nominations uh, in, in, in primary, 24.3% in secondary, but it's only 3.9% for peers and 2.4% for peers, and that's what's reported in all the literature. But they published a second paper, and you, you don't need to publish the second paper, you just look at the, the data, and this comes out. This is, the, this is I pulled this out. Actually, the numbers are... Um, uh, 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 seven peers and two with special educational needs felt they had no, no friends in the primary, and 27 peers and four with identified special educational needs in, in secondary. So we're approaching, you know, I don't know, uh, five, over five, six, seven percent of children saying we don't have any friends. Forget the special needs, we've got a problem with friendship in school. And, and when you see something like that, you understand why there's some people have a problem with friendship at school, but when you start seeing all the mental health issues that people have, and one of the things is, I, look, I've got a row of friends up there, not one of them would have been at school with a year with me. Simon was at school with me, and he lived down the, down the road from me, I and mean, he's only my friend because he lived down the road from me. Okay? Not a single friend. Kit, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's Jan sitting over there. He's ancient, and I, I, he's, he's my best mate for, because I get on with him. We have things in interest. We, we bore each other about endless topics. Um, that's what friendship's about. And my, my friends from school, you know, there are one or two of them um, who were in the same year as me. We expect everybody to get on. We put them together. Um, friendship is a problem. So how am I trying to um, uh, explain this? Well, this is my expansive model uh, of interdependence, now with an N in it. Thank you. I, I originally had it saying A expansive model. Um, and it was pointed out at the rehearsal that I got it wrong. Uh, and it's meant to be a representation of uh, a sociocultural understanding of, of, of the world that we live in. And the point of a sociocultural understanding is that it's constantly shifting and moving. We define it by our relationships. We define it by who we are within a context and a situation. And this is time to, to, to represent this chaotic, dynamic, social, environmental, biological processes in which we are um, situated. And... Um, uh, boundaries are permeable. Absolutes than here are always an illusion, but they're an illusion of time. If you spend enough time in one place, it feels like you're in a permanent place, but of course you're not. Um, entropy is, is, is ongoing. Um, uh, and even labelling uh, the components of this, this complex interplay reduces our capacity to represent um, fundamental interrelationships that are going on 
within there. And within all of this, learning is a social process. It's a moment of social interplay um, within, the, within an ever-shifting whole. So that's how I, I see it. And the problem for that is in a world of complicating, competing and contradictory, endless uncertainty, what we all want is we want certainty. We, we want to feel that we're secure. We want to believe we're in the mainstream. So we have this sense that this is what we're all together. We're all in this together, folks, and we're chugging along. Uh, qualifications you could put on there, careers you could put on there, peers, subjects, schools. They don't, you could, instead of mainstream, all of those things give us that sense. If it, oh, no, we're all together. It's nice and secure going along here. Um, at best, they're a metaphor for certainty. Um, and, what, and, and education has become uh, it, uh, positioned as a ongoing, lifelong, uh, work-related pathway that you can follow through. It's presented about being about hope. Education is your hope for the future. Uh, you never finish it. It's an on, you, you'll die and you still could do another qualification. Um, and, uh, and the narrative of personal transformation uh, and social justice is mixed up with this talk about individual employability, economic and com competitiveness um, of yourself and of the nation. Uh, all these 21st century skills uh, that we're meant to have that are going to make us there, um, you know, right for the workplace. Um, and to ensure the boundaries of the mainstream, uh, the flow, um, we currently have a policy discourse which is around choice and around efficiency and around standards which are going to define this mainstream and it's going to make sure it flows and the boundaries are all clear and we're all cosy and it feels it's like that but then when you look at what schools actually look like when you go to schools actually it doesn't provide the certainty that we want it to provide uh, Norway this is a Norwegian Minister of Education school is about politics and nothing else Norwegian Minister of Education Research, uh, in an interview um, with a researcher. And when I see this, I'm thinking, why, why, why can he say this? Um, I take it to mean he means politics at a macro level and a micro level, you know, at, uh, down between us and, and up there uh, in schools. Um, uh, but partly, I think it's because as much as school is about um, ensuring that um, uh, it's about transformational learning. Schools are also about s sorting people. They're about ensuring uh, we maintain our social structures. Um, schools are about creating success and failure. If we have, a, I'll repeat that, schools are about creating success and failure. They can't be anything else. If we have a system which is premised on norms, on levels, ages, grades, as ours is, um, it has to create failure. Despite having uh, a Minister for Education and a head of Ofsted who said that we can get everybody to be average, um, <laughs> some will be better at things than others. Okay? I've got the quote here, but I'm not going to use it because I've run out of time. So uh, that's my one of my favourite things, that one. And it's one of the things where you draw something and you suddenly realise you understand something. I suddenly realise that every word associated with school is about division. Or not every word, but our main words. So here's our mainstream. Um, you know, you could have local authorities, middle, private, child minors, academies, comprehensive, secondaries, um, secondary moderns, homeschooling. There you go. We got it in. Um, uh, it could be a, a range of these things. We, we could, uh, I haven't included um, Montessori, Steiner, um, special schools, by impairment category, um, Prus, uh, Eton. Um, Harrow, Saturday community schools, they're not in there. We could divide it up based according to qualifications or funding streams or a curricula, um, for example. Uh, and then when you put that on this, that's actually what our education system feels like. It, it isn't a mainstream. It's a, a, a collection of overlapping, it's part of the division. It's an overlapping um, identities, emerging relationships. Um, that, that's situated between these dynamic processes, circumstances, structures and histories. Um, and these schools' di uh, disparities um, uh, create uh, economic, philosophical and wider sociocultural um, divisions. Uh, they influence fundamental life choices for people. 
um, and uh, they, they, they make us, uh, they divide us, but, but we believe that in some way we're not divided. And that's problematic. And that's why, as the Minister for Education said, it's all about uh, politics, folks. Because it's all about jostling for your position within this. So, school is also um, a, another, uh, I've got another fundamental problem, which is it, it's about um, separating a child world from an adult world. Um, through its internal structures, it, it perpetuates that and makes that, takes that further, that, um, that separation and subdivision. Uh, so even if we didn't have all the different types of the categories that we were talking about, um, the notion of school itself is, is one about clustering people according to age. Um, I, I've mentioned my, that, that, that I, the feeling I had about friendship, but the same thing goes about age. Actually, um, uh, you know, we try and say people are developmentally like this or developmentally like that, but actually interest isn't developmental. Um, so age is actually a very clumsy way of putting people together. Um, uh, convenient for, for us, but, but clumsy. Um, the, uh, yeah, so our school structure represents how we understand childhood. We understand childhood as this place of practice. We take you away into an unreal place, you practice and then you come out and you're ready for the real world and you pass your tests and you come through and you're ready to enter adulthood. Um, and you practice separation from people. Um, as much as you um, uh, 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 practice togetherness with people. So you're identified by your difference. So you are identified, and I don't mean that by you've got Down syndrome, you've got ADHD. You're identified by, I do biology, history and sociology. You are a different human being to one who does art, uh, Welsh and trouser, no, they don't do trouser pressing. Anyway, uh, whatever. <laughs> but you see what I mean. You are a different, or you're, you're the person who just does art and Welsh because you're not allowed to do anything else. You're a fundamentally different person. Um, and at the, the heart of who we, are, we, we study, uh, our school identity, is who we study with and what we study. What we study and with whom. So let's start with what we study. Um, so uh, Bourdieu uh, did a review of the, the French education system in the, in the 90s uh, and one with, uh, with a colleague whose name has just slipped my, my mind at the moment. Uh, and uh, he identified the subject as a core uh, a barrier to transforming the education system. And the subject's a core barrier to, uh, to this because the subject is a backbone of the status quo. You can only change a subject by, by being an expert in a subject. You're only listening to me because Mary said I'm a professor. Yeah? And, I, and I got made a professor. And now I've, I've risen up. I've risen up through, the, 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 through this technically, technical, technical rationality of the education system. Uh, you know, 30 years ago, um, when I was a, a, a student, uh, my knowledge wasn't as great, and I had then had to pass exams and move forward, and up and up and up. And now I've, I've reached these dizzy heights. And the thing that makes me reach the top of the heights, I do research. So that's kind of like places you at the top of this technical rationality um, ladder. Um, and you must pass through the levels to be respected. And you can't be, just the fact I'm a, I'm a professor, I can't go and tell a physicist how to do their job. Yeah? I've, I've that, in that area, I've got no knowledge at all. I'm useless. So I'm only good if I'm in my place. Um, so it's a wonderful story. Caroline and I um, uh, were, were attending a local church we'd been invited to go to. There was a friend, uh, uh, some we knew who was dying of cancer, and they wanted to speak to the, um, to the congregation before they died. And uh, he told this story. And the story, he said, is I, I started at school and um, uh, I, I was doing O-level physics, and they taught me about the atom. And I understood about the atom, and I did my O-level exam, and I passed my O-level exam, and it was fantastic. And I got to my first year of A-level, and they told me that what I'd learned about the, o the atom in the first year of in my O-level was wrong. So they retaught me about that. And then they got to the second year of A-level, and they told me what they'd taught me in the first year of my A-level about the atom was wrong. Anyway, I passed the A-level, I got to university, I knew about the atom, and in the first year at university, they told me what I'd learned at the A-level about the atom was wrong. <laughs> and then the second, he said, by the second year, I'd got it. And actually, I spent the whole of my life as um, a, a low-orbit astrophysicist. Not him. It was his topic area. Um, <laughs> he, he was studying the atom. 
and he died, or he said, I still don't know what the atom is. Now, if he had done the GO level, he knew what the atom was. Or, if he was a really bright physicist who wasn't going on to A levels, he'd have worked out he probably didn't, but he'd be fairly convinced that someone up there did. And the problem with subjects is it really does encourage us to think there's an expert out there who's got the answer. Now, I'm all for expertise, but expertise to me is not knowledge you get from a book as much as your capacity to do something in the moment that's useful. Your capacity to, 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 to be an expert when it's needed. Um, not, not this thing that I've got because I'm now a prof. I'm no good at French, folks. Don't get me into do French teaching. And subjects also, this, creating this cellular view, they also, you know, who studies what subjects? Girls study certain types of sciences. Boys are more likely to study arts, particular art subjects, particularly science subjects. Particular types of children study vocational subjects. So the subject, again, defines the identity of us. And I haven't started on ability grouping. Um, which, which the, all the research shows, fundamentally, low, uh, if you put a child in a, in a low ability group, what's going to happen is you're going to have lower expectations and lower outcomes. If you put them in a higher, a higher ability group, you're going to have higher expectations and higher outcomes. And there's going to be some kind of impact on their social identity. Now, it's an awful lot easier for teachers. It is much easier to teach uh, 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 you know, if you group people up. It's actually, it's not. It just feels it. Once you've actually done the other, you realise it's not. But it feels, it's really quite frightening. It's again about certainty, I think. But that's another paper that John Parry and I are working on, and I'm not allowed to talk about it. Um, so, so the other thing that does it is class. And the class separates us up. It's a vehicle for the subject. It separates us up according to age. It separates us up according to ability, uh, subject area. It's the realm of the class teacher. It's where long-term relationships take place between the pupils and, uh, the, and the teachers. It's hierarchical, traditionally. Uh, it organises the daily timetable. Um, and at the heart of it are the attitudes of the teacher, which they exemplify to the other, the other pupils. So this is the means by which the teacher uh, uh, expresses uh, how, how other children should respond to uh, a child within the class and the other children uh, demonstrate it as well. And there's, there's so much research evidence to show that teacher uh, characteristics and teachers' understandings of difficulties and identities of children within their class can initiate, can exacerbate, can resolve, uh, can mediate problematic behaviours. Um, and there's strong evidence that Kieran and I did, uh, we did a review of um, uh, looking at uh, uh, special educational, um, effective provision for children with special educational needs. And one of the key findings was that teachers who take responsibility for all children have a profoundly different way of communicating with the child to the, ch the teachers who see the child as being the responsibility of someone else, which is what a huge number of teachers uh, do in this country. Often not because they don't want to have the time with other children, but they don't feel they've got the time to be with these other children. So they will say things like, get your pencil out, sit down, have you done your homework? Whereas the teacher who sees the child as their responsibility will say, so then, what do you think we mean by three plus two? How do you understand that? So how are you going to make that happen? So they talk about learning in a completely different way. Another one that's lovely, disabled children frequently taken and put out, they're given their therapy sessions in break. That's great. Um, or they're taken out of the subject that they're good at so that they can do their... their because they don't need... There's a lovely piece of work um, uh, where the guy's taken out... Of, the stairs go nowhere. And the guy's taken out of maths because he's good at maths. So the, the class is a... Um, I've got loads of stories about that. Let's move on. OK. But, and this is the thing, is that the, the fundamental problem with the class is it's this need to control. Um, uh, the, the teacher has to control this situation. We just saw a video earlier on, weren't we? We were just looking at, from India. How many kids do you reckon were in that class? To, uh, 50, 90. One teacher, 90, 90 uh, um, students. And he had not control. Um, uh, uh, but your problem if you're a teacher is you, is you face uh, 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 children who have difficulties. You, you've got three options. You either get, you get the, the kid out, um, you change your practice, um, or um, in some ways you, you change the child's behaviours. And the easiest one is to get them out, put in an intervention programme to change their behaviours. The hardest one is to change your practice. 
Um, and the problem is, is that the behaviours that are causing us problems in school, the main reason that people are suspended and kicked out is because they don't behave school in the school way. So how many of you put your hands up before you speak? How many of you call other people sir and miss? One of the things I love is the golden rules that are in class, which say, uh, which supposedly are always written with the children, and they're always exactly the same every year. <laughs> and one of them will always say, do not interrupt. We, we do not interrupt, it will say. And the teacher walks into the class and says, right, be quiet. So the first thing a teacher does is interrupt and break their golden rules. The golden rules don't apply to teachers. Should. Bells, hands up to talk, sitting in silence and listening to one person talking at us. This is education, yeah? Um, collective punishment. You could say that sitting and having to listen to one person talking is collective punishment, but... <laughs> But we don't do collective punishment, but we do in school. Um, we're drafted into school, we have to follow the rules. Um, perhaps this should not be a surprise, though. Um, so much of this is rooted in history, other things that we've done. Uh, and so my, one of my favourite ones is drill. Now, in the, in the 1890s, drill was introduced into this country and schools were paid on the basis that they did drill. Uh, it's in the law, uh, and, and if they didn't do drill, then they had to charge children. And this was Swedish drill, and it carried through. I was in school, we were still doing it in, in the 60s and the 70s, weren't we, Simon? We were doing drill. Uh, and, and drill uh, is, amazingly, I was just checking this out, saying, thinking, oh, this is still going on. So in Queensland, uh, earlier on this year, a high school, a high school has implemented military classes twice a week to tackle behaviour. And it's very common to hear that what we need is more, more military in school. Um, now, we, this, this emerges from a fear of the Prussians. Um, and other countries were fearful of other groups. And it's, that's why they put it in the legislation. And it's still here. It's still there in our behaviour, what we believe is the right behaviour in schools, our notions of punishment. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, uh, we seek control over the collective. But, because it's education, and because we're humans, we're also a bunch of individuals. So we have to do it through the individual. But, as I said earlier, this learning process is social. So we've got all these contradictions. So, here's the one that really bugs me. Um, uh, it's an obsession with, um, uh, uh, the, with, with individuals. So th what I've got, got here is um, a, a research project. Alice Page-Smith, sadly not with us, she, she died a, a couple of years ago. Alice was great, uh, and she, she and I did a research project, and we went away and we did some research with um, uh, two families over a five-month period, and we went to hang out in their house. It was great. We took them for pizzas. It was fantastic. And they were doing early intervention. In all the places they did early intervention, we went and watched them. And we interviewed them, we interviewed all the practitioners, we had a really good time, and a uh, fascinating project. And about a year later, we, we, we were starting to think about the importance of context. And we came up with this way of thinking about it, and we went back to the data to explore it. Now, this is based on Rogoff uh, and Rogoff's lens, and, and that you look at, the, look at the world. One of the things to, to recognise is that if you hold up a lens, what you've got is all this other stuff is around you. It's still going on. You just happen to be looking through the lens at that moment. So you, this is what you're focusing on. And in, in talking to the, the practitioners, what was evident was that when they talked about the child and the child's learning context, they were aware to a certain degree about personal, professional, cultural, situational uh, values, beliefs, practices, knowledge, underlying assumptions. That was implicit in their conversation. They referred to this stuff. And then when they talked about the child, they talked about the community, the services, the self, the pedagogy, professional practices, peers, funding, the, everything. The child was just one factor. And then we went away and we got one child's uh, paperwork, um, nine years old, uh, 5.75 kilos of paperwork. And we went through it all and we found the paperwork that mentioned context. And it was 150 pages. It was around... It was... It was uh, um, Ah, uh, 75, 750 grams of paperwork that was. And we went through all of that and we looked for context. And in that, we found um, the only mention of context was a focus on the child's performance in an activity, noting the presence of an adult, discussing issues of behaviour, generalising mention, generalised mentions of other children. Only once was there mention of how a child's interaction with his peers supported his learning and only one mention of policy. So this is what emerged from the paperwork. There's the child, nothing. 
But we all know it's this. All the teachers know it's this. All the health workers, all the parents, everybody knows it's this. But this is what our system makes you focus on. And exams do exactly the same thing. Your GCSEs, your A-levels, they do exactly the same thing. Um, so, how would you represent? I wanted to think of a way to represent you. So this is the... So, oh, oh, rubbish, there we go. This is correct. This is the biopsychosocial model. The World Health Organization uses it. It's very popular. I don't necessarily agree with it, but it's a, a, a way of understanding the person, the individual, who's got a problem. So it, it, it's a, a way of understanding disability and impairment. And so you look at the biological aspects of someone's life, their psychological aspects of their life, the social aspects of their life, and then you, um, you use those as the basis for your assessment. What's brilliant is that there have been research projects that show that when it's applied this model, for instance, there was one in Portugal I saw, people just didn't bother with those two. They, they just took the bio... Actually, they did a bit psychological. They just bothered... Which was the traditional stuff. Yeah? This was the bit that was added to try and radically change things uh, in the model. So you take this model of the individual and you do all this assessment and you spend a great deal of time and money doing this assessment and then you do that. What was the point of it? Everything's just moved. All you've got, the best you've got, is a momentary snapshot of this person. And it's the same when you do your exams. It's the same when you do... Because I'm... I, you know, the idea that I've stopped growing... I had this argument with my daughter the other day, that I haven't stopped growing. I'm going... You know, she's going, well, you're ageing, it's different. No, you didn't say that. Somebody else said, you're ageing, it's different. I'm still... It's an ongoing process. And this creates the other. That's the other thing. This creates... Separates us. We are now the other. You did different exams. You've got a different label. And our school system's doing it. So the other thing is you can't rely on it. So this is uh, looking at... Uh, I did this in 2013, 2015. I haven't done it again since because, I, I, to be honest, I thought I'd prove the point to myself. Um, uh, these are the diagnosis that is used for, um, uh, by uh, local authorities. Nowadays, they have four categories of special educational needs that's included within the, um, uh, the code of practice. Um, uh, but these categories were, are, were st are still being reported back by the local authority because these are the ones, so they're still being used, uh, or they were in 2015. And these, I took the, the, the top 10 local authorities that used a diagnosis and the bottom 10 local authorities that used a diagnosis because you had some wacky outliers. For instance, um, autism... Uh, on autistic spectrum disorder, in one local authority, 3.47% of children were diagnosed with autism. In another local authority, it was 22.37. Now, are you telling me there's the water difference is that great between those local authorities? And this is, in ev any single one of these categories, it's four times more in the top ten local authorities who use it than in the bottom ten local authorities that use it. Even... A physical disability or a hearing impairment. The only one that's not, which is two to one, is um, to do with behaviour. Now called social, emotional and mental health. Um, I could show you so many more things like this that just show you can't rely on these ways of evaluating and measuring. And I would say the same thing applies to um, our education system more generally. Um, of course, individual support... <laughs> See, Kieran? It gets to people, Kieran. <laughs> Kieran hates them. Um, so, um, of course, individual support and diagnosis can be, can be useful. I'm not pretending it's stupid not to... I, if I've got a problem, I want a doctor who's going to be able to say there's something wrong with me. I, if, I, if, if you've got someone in the class who's, who's struggling in a class or in a, with a group of people, to have someone who's got experience of working with someone to help them, enable them to, to, to engage in that process, that's great. But to spend all your time doing the assessment before you do it or whilst you're doing it just seems daft, which is a technical term. Um, <laughs> And more importantly to me, in many ways, and I think Janet was talking about the political earlier on today, is it doesn't provide a mechanism by which we can challenge the legacy practices um, or the wider social context. If we're always focusing on the individual, we can't challenge this bigger stuff. And it's the bigger stuff that um, 
I'm trying to point out today. So let's finish this little section with The Simpsons, because oh, you can't okay, The Simpsons. Let's can do it to it. <laughs> Grammar, that is. Uh, everybody write down the sentence and circle the nouns. Bart is the newest addition to our menagerie. You have the honors. Um, uh... Well, let's start by reading the sentence. Two Wintham and Jolly words. <laughs> so, you never learned cursive? Well, I know hell and damn and bit. I've got a cursive handwriting script. You know the multiplication tables? Long division? I know of them. Mm. You know, Bart, I think you'd profit from a more remedial environment. I'm sure you'll feel right at home in the Leg Up program. <gasps> so, what are you in for? I moved here from Canada, and they think I'm slow, eh? I fell off the jungle gym, and when I woke up, I was in here. I start fires! Okay. Now, everyone take out your safety pencil and a circle of paper. This week, I hope we can finish our work on the letter A. Let me get this straight. We're behind the rest of our class, and we're going to catch up to them by going slower than they are? Cuckoo! 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 Stop it! Stop it! Warren! Melvin! Gary! Dot! Gordy! Look, lady, I'm supposed to be in the fourth grade. Sounds to me like someone's got a case of the spozdas. I like me. Everyone's a winner. <laughs> okay, so um, I, 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 we we are going to come on to discuss this in the in the in the session afterwards as well. Um, but I, I'll I'll just spend um, uh, the last few minutes having a um, a, a look at this. Um, we may wish to be education schools to be about transformation. We may write about that in our policy document, um, but it is also fundamentally about sorting and control. That's the purpose of the education system. And our processes of sorting and control, control constrain the transformation of individuals and wider society. Um, so how can we move beyond the limitations of our pedagogy, our curriculum, our assessment, um, which are inextricably linked to these processes of sorting and control? We need to look beyond the taking for granted skills and behaviours of school to ask um, what do we want people to learn, what is the best way to support them to learn it. And we've got to remember that people have been saying what I've been saying for an awfully long time. Nothing that I've said really is new. Um, uh, I've just updated the examples. So it's not like we haven't heard this message before. So um, we can do something about it. And really it comes down to we need to reconsider how we group people, how we group learners, how we enable them to learn together, um, how we evidence that learning so it's trusted. Um, and to do that, I would maintain that we have to look beyond the individual. We need to build on the social learning practices, the social learning, the social nature of learning processes. So we need to break open the class. Um, now, schools are already doing this. There are plenty of schools, and I'm sure James will we'll talk about how schools are, are, are doing this now uh, all around the world but there are plenty of schools that are not um, and we must allow for individual work we must allow for small group work we must allow for large group work we must allow online virtual work um, it, people need to have public sharing it, it needs to have an opportunity to be authentic and real um, but people also need privacy they, they must have that ability to get away from the public of it um, they must work in different places. They must be used to that. Um, and they must work to people with different people for different reasons, not just because they're the same age or deemed to be the same ability, but because I've got a list here, so I might as well read it. They share an interest. They like each other. They need to get on. Life is random. Um, for support, to support, to learn from each other, to want to achieve the same standard. Because you still have people who want to... You're always going to have people who, who want to work, at, you know, uh, trying to do something together. Um, and you need, some people are going to need specific or regular support to be able to do something. And that's cool. You don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, some people want to avoid distraction. 
time, privacy. And school space comes up again. We keeps coming up today in our, in our conference today we've been having. It's a physical place, but it's a place which creates identities and routines, local identities and routines. And space is socially, culturally, historically situated um, and constructed. Uh, it's, it's an interlink, and it's between people as well as around people. And it frames our actions and our understandings, and we frame the space by our actions and our understandings. So these new schools are open. They're supposed to encourage collaboration, um, exploration, um, self uh, direction. Uh, they're created in this way because it's understood that relationships, structures and routines and educational support um, create and emerge from space. Um, but uh, what, it's not just walls and breakout spaces. Um, old practices can re-emerge in a new space. Old, uh, old buildings can be re-understood. So nowadays, when you do reading for pleasure, when you do the reading sessions in, in class, people all are not to sit at desks and look like traditional readers. But they're still all reading in silence. You've all got to do it. So we've gone one way, but we've still got a, 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 a problem in there in the, in, the, in, the, in the way that we've constructed that space. So we need to reconceive the class space and the relationships within it. It needs to reflect those permeable boundaries, those dynamic relationships that we were talking about. And the pedagogy, and it's really interesting, as somebody we were talking about today was about how teachers have lost the ability to talk about curriculum um, because it's been taken from us. Uh, curriculum is something that comes from above now. Um, so I've put curriculum in some ways in a bracket. Um, but, but pedagogy uh, is uh, things that have emerged from sociocultural, uh, socio, um, social constructivist uh, viewpoints, um, ideas around um, scaffolding, uh, zones of proximal development, uh, learning communities, uh, communities of practice. These, these things are all language that's used um, in relation to schools um, uh, frequently now. It's understood. Teachers get this. Po uh, and lots of policy makers get this as well. I mean, particularly outside this country, it's gobsmacking to read policies that, that recognise this. Um, uh, and the, the pedagogies that emerge, for instance, when we did, Kieran and I did our study, um, is, is actually good teaching for all. Um, they're pedagogies that are, don't require uh, specific expertise. Um, they, 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 tend, they move from the teacher at the front model. Um, they're rooted in social relationships. So the things around collaboration, feedback, um, uh, peer support, uh, multiple literacies, um, uh, uh, and I think like, um, sorry, routines, creating routines. Now, it comes from a behaviorist paradigm, but even that's about a social relationship. It's about creating those social moments in the learning situation. And showing outside is um, a, a, a way to create the space within the curriculum for this, which is far more open-ended activities. So we've got a film that's showing out there, a fabulous one from Finland about how deep do fish swim in winter, um, which hopefully will have subtitles. There's one from, a couple from, one from the States about um, equity in science, another one about art lessons and, and how you can have open activities. Um, uh, I'm coming to, I'm nearly at the end. So I'm going to, this is my almost but last slide. Um, the, the, the bit that I think is probably the most important to, to enable this to happen, it shouldn't be, but is assessment. We need to get away from this, this individualised, subject-based model of validating learning. And I mean that in universities as well. Um, uh, although we probably have got more of a get-out clause because we have this entry point. Um, you have to pass to get into us. We're supposed to be academic. Um, so maybe we can, we can argue about that. Um, so final assessment, subject-based uh, model of validating versus, versus what I would suggest we need to do is to focus more on collective activity and key social interactions and capacities to do that. Um, and this would open up the pedagogy and the curriculum for teachers. If we're evaluating understanding and behaviour in context, we give ourselves time and space to step back. We step back as learners and as teachers. We're encouraged to plan for the social. Um, participation, um, to plan for people, to include people in the collective. And participation, therefore, becomes about a meaningful engagement in process. Um, school becomes less about dividing um, and more about a, and, and, uh, dividing to achieve a goal 
and more about uh, seeking uh, whatever will bring people together to enable learning. Of course, we need to evaluate the collective endeavour uh, fairly and representative in a way that's trusted. And that's a key thing that schools have got to do. They've got to send this person out into this world so that the world can feel that they know them and start to situate them in, in the world outside. Now, personally speaking, I, I, I would advocate a CV. I, I can't understand why we can't have CVs. We have them in the workplace, why we can't have them coming out of school. Uh, I've been working with uh, Peter, who will be talking later, on a, um, a, a sociocultural way of evaluating um, um, a professional development that could also be used in, in a context of a, of a CV. Um, I would also uh, be uh, moving uh, away from a collective model of planning. And I wrote a paper in 2007, which is outside, um, which was a model for just a completely different way of funding special education so that it looks at the collective and how you fund the collective. It would reduce lots of things and free up the time for the professionals to actually work with children rather than assess them. Um, it seems to me that we have a, a lot of the simple things that we could do that would actually just require a, a change in understanding um, at the, about how we want to assess and evaluate and that that would open up the space for the pedagogy and a change curriculum. So school, and I think teachers want to do this. That's the other thing. I think teachers are constrained. Yeah. So school is our decent social response to social injustice, but it is also our response to the need for social control. When we look at our individualised divisive model, however, we can see how we perpetuate injustice and disharmony. If we embrace the social nature of learning in our community spaces, our pedagogy and our assessment, we will get much closer to achieving both the social justice and the social control we seek. And I think that's really important. I think actually it would make schools better at what we say we want them to do, which is to have that control. I think if it comes from people, they're going to be much better at it. Um, and it will also provide all those skills of collaboration and so forth that governments say that they want and are seeking. So school is our solution, and I'm back at the beginning, and you've got that as my final slide. Thank you very much.